The Big Al Podcast with your host, Al Bishop, unfiltered and uncut. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm joined today via the phone again uh, with the master, Chris Bright. Welcome to the show, sir, and thank you very much for your time. So thanks, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I don't know about a master, but it's, it's very cool to be on the show. <laughs> the grandmaster in my eyes, in any case. Um, on that note, Chris, w- where I'd like to start, I think it's, I think it's quite a cool story, and like I, I know bits and pieces of it from what I've heard and read. But I, I'd like to go back in time with you and and, and and discuss the beginning of your journey, how how especially the BJJ started for you and how eventually that evolved into MMA, if you could just talk us through that. Wow, it's going back a long way. Like, it was like a funny thing because it all happened by accident. You know, I used to play team sports and then, you know, you could have your best day and, and your team could still lose. And then I was I was kind of looking for something and I started doing judo and and I used to compete at judo tournaments and then I, I, I saw UFC 1 and I saw Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So there was some guy in Cape Town, Lizzie Stratum, was holding jiu-jitsu or grappling comps in Cape Town. So I, I ended up going straight from a judo mat into a jiu-jitsu comp to see, you know, because I, I enjoyed the ground. Um, and as it happened, I, I got a second against, well, against one of his, he had quite a good guy there, and I got a second place there. And half the stuff this guy did, I've just never never seen before. Like, he was re-guarding me, and he was attacking with triangle chokes, and I didn't know what the hell he was doing. And then, then it stuck. I really, that's, that's like the, the shorter answer. Um, and then I, I went straight back, and then I started, I started training, training more specifically on the ground. I still did judo for a while. Um, till actually, I, I did judo till I had my first MMA fight. And then I, I, I kind of stopped judo completely, and I really focused on wrestling specifically, and, and went more into like MMA specific stuff. But it was like, kind of, it, it was like, it was never really planned. You know, one thing, one thing just led to another. It wasn't like I woke up one day and said, I really want to do this. It was, and a comp came up, and then I was I was doing judo, and it just like it, it was kind of an accident, really. I take it at that time there wasn't uh, too much BJJ around, especially in South Africa. No, there wasn't at all. I think there was Mike Atkinson in in Durban, um, and then there was Ludwig Stratum in Cape Town, and he had a couple of guys training with him, and then it was then I started a little, little bit after Ludwig in in PE. Um, yeah, no, that that was all I really knew about it. I didn't really know too much what was happening in Joburg then, but I assume there was just, there was probably a couple of guys training up there then, but I, I don't even know who was around back then. But Ludwig, Ludwig was about the first guy that I know of. Wow. How difficult was it to access things like, like training and, and new concepts and stuff like that? Uh, who actually taught oh, you gosh. PJJ at that time? In the beginning, there was really nothing. Um, we, we, we'd we actually watched like UFC, so we'd, we'd sit and watch like Hoist Gracie choking guys in the UFC, <laughs> and then we'd, we'd, we'd try to copy that. And that was we we try to figure out off off like old UFC VHS was what Hoyt Gracie was doing, and then we you know really just try to make it happen. <laughs> and then eventually I went to I went to Cape Town. I spent a week with Ludwig, and he got gave me some fundamentals, you know, like kind of explained um, energy conservation and just like the, the difference between Jiu Jitsu and Judo, and and then it went from there. And then it was like my old Mario Sperry VHS tapes, you know, and a whole lot of trial and error. And I, I think that's the difference now. What we had, what we took five years to figure out, you can teach a guy in, in like a week of sessions. I, I hope a lot of guys realize what guys like yourself had to go through to get to where you are now. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a way it's actually quite cool because you know everything you learn you understand. Sure. You don't you don't just get um, told you know put your hand here, put your foot there, and then it works. You actually understand the principle behind it, sure. and and you know what makes a technique stick. In that in that sense, it's it's a bit of a long approach, but it, it's an advantage. Jeez, I, I take my hats off to you guys that, that had to kind of learn BJJ in that way when there was no real ground broken, if we can put it like that. You kind of had to figure it out for yourself. You laid the tarmac for the rest of us, which is awesome. <laughs> it was actually quite funny because I, I I kind of fell into coaching because I had to make my own training partners. Sure. <laughs> so it was, it was, you know, everyone, there's a lot of guys that want to be a coach and I, I love coaching, but it was never that I worked. I was always a competitor. So and then if I didn't have a good training partner, I couldn't compete. I eventually learned to to get guys from completely raw to a decent level of rolling fairly quickly because it, it benefited me. So I had better training partners. 
it's <laughs> it's quite an investment for for some training <laughs> having to get Absolutely people up to guys. speed and and then i had so many guys we, there'd be like two guys training together it'd be me and somebody else and then just when that guy got to be decent he would he would quit or he'd leave town or something and i'd have to start fresh with a new guy and for a long period in my career, when I was fighting, I had that. I would, I would have like one or two guys. One guy would leave, one guy would quit. And then I was training with like brand new beginners. The next thing I wanted to discuss with you quite briefly, or, or as brief as you want really, yeah. um, was your lineage. Um, I, am, is it correct to say that you got a certain belt from, from the master, Roger Gracie himself? I, I got my purple from him, yeah. Okay. So that was right, and then you—that was actually that was actually my first first belt. I didn't I wasn't I didn't do blue. I trained with with Hodge. He, he graded me straight to purple, which is pretty awesome. And wh- where was that? Where were you training yeah. at the time? That was in Cape Town. It was in Cape Town. I was still training with Nick Gregoriotti. We were we were mates for a long time, and he introduced me to Hodge, um, and he was out doing seminars, and we, we got to train together a little bit. That was pretty cool. Yeah, pretty legit lineage. That's very cool. And then the, the the most interesting part for me, for me, which I don't think a lot of people know, uh, was you qualifying for the ADCC. Was it 2007? I think it was 2007, yeah. It's going back a long way. Um, and I get hit in the head quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, it was 2007 and it was in New Jersey. Yeah, that's right. Pretty cool. I was, I was unlucky enough to pull Andre Galvaro in the first round. <laughs> and I didn't even know who he was at the time. <laughs> So, so we were around all these guys that I knew who like the, like certain guys were, you know, I knew like Hoyle Grace, you know, I was looking out for all the guys I had from my VHS and and when I pulled Andre Galvo and like everybody went like, Oh well, that's bad <laughs> and and I I could tell by the reaction that, that this guy was supposed to be someone that was really good but I I I can so ignorance is bliss actually. It's probably sure. better that I didn't know. And and, and how <laughs> how did that pan out for those that don't know? <laughs> Because it could have been worse. Because it went better than the last time I rolled with him. Um, it lasted six or seven minutes, but I, I was I wasn't very fit then, so I, I gassed a little bit. But I, I, I back escaped a couple of times. He took my back, and I managed to escape. So I think for what I knew then, I actually I, I did fairly well. Um, it was back in the days when you didn't overthink competition. You just kind of went and whoever was if they threw a heavyweight that you'd be like, yeah, I'm up. So, you know, I wasn't really that. Yeah, it was a weird thing, and he eventually choked me from the back. Um, okay. But yeah, he had to work a little bit for it. Was rolled it? with him since. I, I rolled with him in Cape Town since then, and he mangled me. So yeah, he's, so, he's uh, put on a few kilos I, since I, then, I guess. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, but he was. I, I promise you, it wasn't even strength. He was just so flipping good, and, and like twenty five steps ahead of me, and he was like flowing with me, and I was rolling for my life. <laughs> <laughs> so he's that good. <laughs> Yeah, geez, he is an absolute monster. How, how did you actually go about qualifying for the ADCC? Was it was it a thing you were? I, I've seen a, a couple of clips of you competing in the states, and um, well, I assume it's the states, it's like American commentators and stuff like that. So, so were you competing quite a lot at that stage? Um, oh gosh, I did everything I could back then. Um, the competitions I did, ADCC was in the states, and we actually had an African qualifier at that stage. Mark mm-hmm. Robinson managed to get a qualifier here. And it, it was pretty cool, but it was only we, we did the qualifier like two weeks before the event, so we, we managed to get a team to go, but no one was really that that well prepared for it. So we, uh, we everybody got got smashed. You know, if we if we had a bit more bit more prep time, it would have still been very hard. But I think if we were all fit and kind of ready, it would have been a, would have been a bit better. Yeah. You know, what we what we'd give for a qualifier now, eh? Yeah, no, exactly. In hindsight, eh? but it's also it's not the not the world's easiest competition to to perform in, and I, I suppose you guys no, went no, in quite blind. Yeah, I think a lot of it, I wasn't really like a jiu-jitsu purist then. I, I didn't ever train in the gi or anything, really. So, like, a couple of the guys, like, it was, like, Dave Levy and, and, and there was Daryl Midley and Rico was there. So, we had quite a strong team uh, of, of the guys that were around at that point. And I think they were kind of a little bit more aware of the jiu-jitsu circles than I was. I was, like, an MMA guy that happened to grapple. And uh, on that note, Chris, how, how did the transition to MMA come about? Was that something that was, you say you were more of an MMA guy. Uh, how did that whole transition happen? And when did you decide to start competing in MMA? Well, it's a funny thing. It wasn't like I ever really decided to compete, you know. It's like another one of those jiu-jitsu things where one thing led to another. Um, I, I did that competition in Cape Town with Ludwig's guys. And the guy that beat me in the final 
they had K1, K1 Africa. I think it was 99 or 2000 where Mike Bernardo fought on the main event. And they were looking for two MMA fights. Um, but I don't think, apparently they never had that like, proper MMA like in a legitimate event there. So Ludwig contacted me and he said he doesn't really know that many guys that can fight. Would I be interested in fighting against Russell, the guy that beat me in a jiu-jitsu comp? I was like, yeah, what the hell? You know, I was very flippant about it and um, I didn't actually know what I was getting into. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I wasn't training, punching, with, like really, I was just going into the judo and a little bit of ground. And you know, again, like, like these, these guys are getting to MMA, but they actually have no clue what they're getting into. Sure. And like Russell threw a, he threw in the beginning of the fight, he threw like a flying knee past my ear, and I was like, holy crap, are you allowed to do this? <laughs> so I, had, I had no idea really, and it was still pride rules, so it was like you, like I could stomp, you could suck a kick, and like nowadays, if someone had to sign me up for that, I'd, I'd, I'd be horrified, I'm sure. Sure. But like then, you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'll give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> Oh, and I ended up getting fucking hammered. Like, I couldn't pass Russell's guard. He kept me in his guard but just about the whole fight. I threw him and hit him about 20 times in the beginning of the fight. And I was instantly gassed. I, like, I wasn't prepared for it at all. I was punching him and he just, like, you know, you, you watch a couple of movies, you think you punch a guy and he just goes to sleep and it's not like that. I, like, threw him at, at, at some kind of a slam. I jumped on him, hit him from side control about 20 times as hard as I could and he was still there. Jeez. And then I was blown for the rest of the fight. And it, I was kind of sitting in his guard, but getting hit on the top of my head and elbowed for about 15 minutes. We went the full 15-minute first round, and then I got triangle choked in overtime. <laughs> and I, no, I don't think there was any moment in that fight where I actually knew what the hell was going on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I was concussed for about a week, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then I took, a, I took a, probably about a year off. Not training, I, I took about a year of fighting and I really just like reinvented myself and really got, got focused on MMA and, and starting to learn some guard passing and some actual jiu-jitsu. And mm. it, it went a lot better for me. Okay. And um, your stand-up department is one I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe Kepler Vessels is a, is a boxing coach of sorts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kepler's helped me a whole lot over the years. Um, and when Kepler and I met, I didn't really have much stand up at all, and I didn't really have a passion for it either. I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it. I was, I was always, I'll take a guy down and I'll tap him. I was, I'm still kind of of the opinion that you know you can fight an MMA guy, but if I can beat you in a in a grappling match, I can beat you in an MMA fight. So I still, you know, my my jujitsu has always worked in MMA fights. So I, I was kind of cocky about that. Sure. And then Mr. Kepler came along and he was battering me in boxing for for a while. Um, but he's he's a very good teacher, so he's very analytical and, and he focuses a lot on fundamentals. So we we like minded, and he made he did wonder for my stand up. See now, I've, I've, lately I've been focusing a little bit on my jiu-jitsu again, um, because we've got a whole lot of things coming up jiu-jitsu wise. So I'm I'm helping the team and so I'm rolling a lot. But the, like the last couple of years, I think I've done more striking than I have jiu-jitsu. Okay, and um, Kepler got quite a quite a long history of of boxing then. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know exactly what his record is, but I know he was Australian amateur champ, and he's done a lot of exhibition stuff in South Africa. Jeez, I wasn't even aware of that. It was someone said to me, "No, yeah, Ke- Kepler Vessels a is a boxing coach." I was like, the, the Kepler, "Kepler Vessels, the cricket player?" Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's very feisty as well. If you if you if you touch him touch him hard in sparring, he comes back at you still. <laughs> And uh, he, and you he just gave him his ten rounds of sparring too. Sure, and and you just gave him his blue belt as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I kept a roll every day still, and he's, he's got a good knowledge of the ground. Yeah. He's been working very hard on that for a long time. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, it is pretty cool. Yeah, that, that is awesome. Um, in EFC, you fought EFC one, two, and three. Is that correct? And then we didn't see you. Oh, man, now you're asking. I know, I know I, fought, I fought EFC 1, I can tell you that. And I, I fought the early ones, but uh, like if you're asking me which numbers, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was like 1, 2, and 3, and then we didn't see you for some time. Uh, and then you came back to fight yeah. Adam Speechley and then disappeared again. So th- th- there was something <laughs> like a, a four or five-year gap there. What was happening in that period where you kind of – um, deciding to come back if you wanted to carry on, maybe just taking some time off and then came back and I, uh, you're taking time off again. What's, 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 what's happening there? 
Yeah, well, after my three fights with the UFC, we had a bit of a fallout. Um, there was a, it was like a period where we had a bit of a contractual dispute and we, we didn't get along for a while. Um, but we, we, since, we since mended those bridges and everything's, everything's great between us. Um, and I was looking for fights. I was trying to get fights outside of South Africa and it was really difficult back at that stage. You know, things have developed quite differently now. Sure. Um, but I, I was trying to get fights, but outside of the UFC, there really wasn't anything happening. Okay. And then so it wasn't that I really didn't didn't want to fight. It's just that uh, at that point I didn't want to fight in the UFC. Okay. And then you came back to fight Adam Speechley, and and that was the last time we saw you. So I, yeah, I suppose the question on 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 quite a few people's minds. Obviously, it's 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 one of those weird things. Like you you posted a video the other day. I think that's actually what sparked my mind as well. You said you're doing some MMA rounds for the first time in some in some time. So. Are you thinking of maybe yeah. jumping in one more time or two more times or three more times or it was you... well, yeah, it's, it's like a it's a funny thing hey, because you know I, I never really reached my ceiling in my in my career I never got to that point where I was fighting guys that I couldn't beat so I think I think when you get to that point you can retire fairly satisfied you know you, you know you did all you could do sure and I, I never because of I think the timing of not fighting and just my, my age I, I never really got to that point in my career where I got to the level that I think I could have got to. So the spark's definitely there. Um, I know that the legs are a little bit older than they used to be, but I, I still I, I love competing and I love fighting. So so Graham is talking to me, so we were definitely chatting some potential matches. Um, and I, I realize that I'm up against it age-wise. You know, you have to be you know you have to be aware of things. I'm, I'm not stupid. Um, but in, in many ways, I'm better than I ever was, and I'm smarter. You know, you lose a few things and you gain a few things. Absolutely, and I think there's there's a couple of young dogs there that could uh, learn a few things from you inside the cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is, everyone assumes that when you when you get get older, you you know you're an easy easy win. You know, you you maybe get tired a little bit quicker, or it's potentially harder to get fit. I think you've got to work a little bit harder, and you've got to work a bit smarter at certain things. Um, but I've still got the same brain. I've still got the same jiu-jitsu. I've got better boxing. You know, you maybe lose a little bit of athleticism. I think with age, I think that is one thing that you, you can't deny. Um, but I got certain tools that I never had, so I still don't think that I'm a particularly easy fight for anyone. No, I, I don't. I don't think that it, you'd be an easy fight for for many guys on the roster at the moment. To be honest. Um, I think you, you'd give most guys a pretty hard time, and I think it would be great to see you back in there. I think uh, you're, you're a pioneer of MMA in the country, and, and I think it would be great to see you in there again. Yeah, and it's actually like, a, you know, it's a, it's a thing that, that you're always curious about, or I'm always curious about. It. Back in the day when I was doing MMA, I was like a bit of an anomaly. You know, when none of my friends could figure out why I did it, and I was always being told that I couldn't achieve certain things, and, and that kind of that motivated me. And now I'm at this, at this age where I probably shouldn't be fighting at the level that I could, could fight at now. Um, and, it, and that also sparks some interest. You know, when people start telling me that I shouldn't be doing things and I can't do things, I maybe think, well, this becomes interesting again. And so I'm a little bit perverse, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a motivating factor. I, I'd like to see at my age if I can still be some of the, the highly regarded young fighters. It's definitely interesting. Just to put you on the spot there, Chris, is there anybody that, that comes to mind there straight away if, if you're looking at potential fights? And I'm, I'm guessing you'd go back to lightweight. Um, yeah, I'd say lightweight, I think. I, I was quite interested in, in DeRocha at one point. Um, you know, he's like a nice technical fighter. Um, but I, I see he's, he's moving on and he's getting closer to that welterweight belt now. So I don't see, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Sure. And he's also quite a, he's quite a big bloke. Um, but yeah, I, I think everyone at the top of that, that lightweight division is quite interesting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm also at the point where I'm not looking to climb up ladders, really. Um, I'm more interested, I think, in the internationals. I'm not, not looking to take any South African stuff, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, 100%. 100%. So, like, a marquee mar fight so nice. You know, if I, if I happen to work my way closer to the top, so be it. Um, but, you know, like a big, a big name that's coming off a couple of wins is always, is always great. But whoever's going to put the most buttons in the seat really and, and get the most attention is, is interesting. Sure. It would almost be like a kind of gatekeeper situation for an international, which would make quite a good fight, I think. Um, for example, a guy like Gavin Hughes, 
put him against you, see how he does kind of thing. If, you, if, if you're not too stressed about climbing up the ladders and it's a uh, win-all kind of situation for him, that, that could be quite interesting, I guess. The, uh, there's a couple of names yeah. in, in the lightweight division, I guess, at the moment. That division's opened up quite nicely now. It would be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, there's been a couple of names mentioned. Hughes is one of the names that, that's been mentioned. So I'm, uh, there's a whole lot of matches that haven't happened, so it just makes things a whole lot more interesting now. I and mean, Don Don was quite good, so I think kind of he had a bit of a stamp on that lightweight division. Um, he's obviously pretty good, and he's going to do well in the UFC, I'm sure. Sure. But I think now the, the, okay, things are a little bit more open. Um, it kind of creates an opportunity for all the guys that are just below him. But yeah, he's, he's just someone I'm quite interested in. Um, I'm quite keen for that. Um, I'm not sure what Graham's thinking. He mentioned Hughes. He's mentioned Dave Mazzani. That's quite interesting. Um, sure. And that's quite a nice. That's, that's quite a tough grindy fight as well. So you know, conditioning becomes a factor there, and Dave, Dave puts a lot of pressure on a guy. Yeah, sure. Um, but Hughes, you know, Hughes is uh, apparently, I think, in theory, Hughes is closer to the belt. Um, so you know, if I if I can get that fight, I guess I would I would jump at it. Yeah, he his fight was kind of billed as a number one contender fight, which he won. So he he well, we know how it goes, you know. Um, <laughs> to say he is the now the number one contender, well, we'll see what they do. I guess at the end of the day, um, should be in theory. Yeah, yeah, should be in theory. But you know, uh, MMA promotions are not known for doing everything that they say, and uh, <laughs> at times <laughs> you can't. Be, yeah, at times you can't blame them, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, Graham's got to make a couple of tough decisions this year. There's a, there's a lot of fights, and there's going to be a lot of guys knocking at yeah. the door. So <laughs> he's got he's I got think some. I've also complicated things a little bit for them um, because last year, for almost two years, I've had a, a bit of a hip injury or it's like a, a adductor injury, and it just happened when I was doing sprints one day with one of the guys prepping for a fight. So for the last two, two years, I haven't been able to do any physical stuff. I haven't been able to really move or wrestle or I've kind of been rolling with one leg. Um, and it's the first in two years that I'm pain-free and I can actually train properly. So, so I kind of called Graham off guard. I just phoned him the one day and <laughs> he wasn't really regarding me for a fight. And I just said, listen, I'm not injured. I'm training. If something comes up, let me know. So I threw him a bit of a curveball. I think at the end of the day, they... Um getting great athletes on, on the roster so it is a curveball but at the same time yeah, it's just giving them another option man. yeah and I, I'm also like I think it's, it's good in a way because if, if I do fight I know that I'm going to I'm going to bring a crowd which is which is always good for them yes and, man yeah, yeah absolutely kind of what looking at, so it doesn't really matter how old I am I'm going to be in a, a little bit of an attraction if people I'm appealing to a new middle age market <laughs> <laughs> The, un- the untapped SABC3 market there, waiting to be sorted Absolutely, out. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the balding middle-aged man. <laughs> uh, interesting in that, uh, that you were thoughts of coming back there, Chris, and, and you're quite active in it. Um, I just wanted to ask you, it's a bit of a strange question, like how much has the landscape of, of South African and African MMA changed in the time you've been involved? Obviously, we've gone, we've come into this new era of the EFC with SABC3 and things are crazy and there's internationals coming from all over. EFC is doing massive, massive numbers. They, at most of the time, doing higher numbers than, than UFC on Fox and it's just insanity back from the days when, when, when you couldn't even find somebody to teach you a bit of jiu-jitsu along the way. You know, what yeah. has that been like for, from your perspective, watching all of this develop? No, that's actually crazy. Like the funny thing, it's like also, you know, if, you, if you've if got kids, you watch your kids grow up, but you don't really see them grow. You just look at them one day and go, wow, they got quite big. <laughs> so I think when, you, when you're in it, um, you know, when, you, when you're out of it for a while and you come back, then you, then you see the growth. Um, but I think when you're in it, you don't really tell. Um, and a lot of these guys that are around now haven't, weren't really around when, when it was in its formative years. So it's amazing. Even the, the level of athletes, I just look at the level the guys are training at. Um, I look at the last camp I did with Adam. I've never in my life put in a camp like I did for, for Adam. Um, you know, it, it wasn't my best performance that, I, that I've ever put on, um, but in terms of physical preparation and just the, the the boxes that we ticked, we've never done, I've never done that before. I used, to, I used to roll with guys for two hours at a time and think I'm training for an MMA fight. <laughs> But like just looking at my team and the way the way I like my competitors are training now, I look at the camps they do and I've never done a camp like these guys are doing it. 
Sure. So everything, and I can only imagine the other gyms are doing the same kind of thing. And in that sense, the, the level of athletes that are coming in, you know, guys like like BK and Latando BK, and you know, these guys are like really high level athletes in in, in their own field now coming to MMA. It's, it's like a game changer. Guys like JP Bates. You know, they're, they're great wrestlers and great judokers, and, you know, we've got like very really special people that are coming in now. And that, that's when things really change. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you mentioned Lutando, obviously, is a guy from your camp. You, you, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a strange one for me because it seems like um, you're managing to kind of find the diamonds in the rough there. What is it like? What is the scene like in in, in PE? Because obviously we we see a lot of guys coming out of your camp, high level guys like Lutando and Sindile. <clears throat> I mean, Cam Pritchard was originally from there. What is the MMA scene like there, and, and and how difficult is it is it to run like a fully operational gym? I mean, obviously you've got a big gym, but are the other gyms that are are on the same level as you? Um, are, are you guys able to to like cross train with each other, or just give us a bit of insight on, on what the scene's um, like? Well, we we had like an open sparring day on Saturday where we welcome guys to come and, and train with us. Um, we've got good relations with most of the gyms here, but I think the the big difference is is um is expectation. You know, like when 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 I go, we've got recreational members when they pay their fees to me and they they come and train twice a week. I, I don't mind, but when a guy comes to me and tells me I want to be an MMA athlete. I uh, like almost dissuade them. I go, listen, do you know what it takes? Sure. So a lot of the other MMA gyms around here, they, 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 they're still training like we were training five, ten years ago. You know, they, they pitch up and they do their two, three sessions a week and they, you know, then on the weekends they have a bra and a couple of drinks. So I think there's a lot of amateur MMA around the country that's still, still there. And I think if you look at the teams that are really succeeding, they're the teams that have, have put together a professional platform. So when they get the guys are training like pros, so like even if we if we put an amateur in, the, the, you know the, the guys are prepared like a professional. I think that's that's been that's the secret to our success. You know we don't have a lot of guys coming into our gym in in PE. So like I know like FFM might have 20, 30 pros on the mat, and they can they can I guess like they're going to get some real diamonds there. They're going to get loads of guys. We're in a position where if we've got four guys that come into our team, we need every single one of those to succeed. So we have a good team. You know so. And, and, and it works for us. It's really worked for us so far. You know, we haven't got too big that we can't manage it. I, I get I, I get to spend time with every single guy that we have in our team. I get to roll and train and spar with every single one of those guys, and, and so they they benefit from that experience, I think. Um, and I also understand the formula, and I kind of know what it takes to be a successful fighter. So firsthand, so I'm like I'm, I'm making sure that we follow the same formula we've always followed. You know, we're growing and learning new things, but we, we, we're still following the same formula. We, we're not following trends. We're not, like, trying to find our feet. You know, we've been doing this for a while now. I think we, we, we might be one of the oldest, most successful MMA clubs in the country. And, um, I think we've been doing it from from about 2003. We've, we've been growing fighters and, and testing things. And so, so now we have our formula. We, we're sticking to it. And a lot of the younger gyms that kind of testing things. They're having success, but they they like kind of find their feet and find out which direction they want to go in. And I don't think we're there anymore. So that that gives us a bit of an advantage. Yeah. But not every not every MMA gym in PE either. And there is the market is growing. We've got some local shows that are popping up now which is pretty cool. So starting to create more gyms and, and more fighters are coming through. Um but I think when they want to come to me, they're getting a lot of them get a bit of a shock about what I expect. You know, they they watch, a couple of guys watch movies and they think that you know they train twice a week and you go and smoke afterwards and you're gonna make it. Um, I'm totally blunt about it. I, you know, I, I can be like friendly, but then when it come when you cross the line, you go, listen, please teach me, make make me a fighter. Then I don't I don't mince words. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a different thing for me. It's almost like sacred. So if you want to be a fighter, there's only one way to do it, and if you're not doing it right, like I'm the guy that's gonna tell you. You know, that and that works. You know, it's the only way. And the Kepler's also like that. It's things are black or they're white when it comes to this, this game. You know, guys get hurt. So I almost make it as difficult as possible to be a fighter. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, a, it's an extremely thing, difficult thing to do. You know, it's a, it's one of the maddest things, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think, in modern sport. It's just a absolute, absolute phenomenon to me still. And I'm, I'm still amazed every time I watch a fight at what's actually going on, you know. So I, I think that's yeah, a great I way to be. Everybody to do jiu-jitsu. 
hundred percent. Like if people come in the door and they want to be a fighter, I go, okay, get a gear on, do jiu jitsu, come come with us to some jiu jitsu comps. Sure. Come and spar on Saturday. Tell me tell me how you feel after after Saturday sparring, you know. And a lot of the guys that the, the guys that have generally become the best fighters are guys that have come in quietly and they they just want to do a bit of grappling and and all of a sudden you look back six years later, but it wasn't guys that walked in desperate and got please I need to fight. It was again the guys that had happened more by accident, I think. They they were the guys with staying power. Yeah, hundred percent, and I think it's it's a sport that guys uh, fall in love with uh, along the way. Like you say, it's not people don't just arrive and say, "Yeah, absolutely, please make me the best fighter." Yeah, it's 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 completely a lifestyle. It's not a it's definitely not a hobby. I was I was going to say if we hook a fight up, I don't mind Graham giving me that fairly short notice because the moment he tells me that I'm fighting, my whole life becomes about that. So like I, I wake up to go to the bathroom at three in the morning, the first thing I think about is this guy's face. <laughs> And, you know, and so so like if, if it's a six like a five to six week camp, the less time I have to think about this, I'm already doing the training in the in the hard yard. So like, yeah, you know, I, I get a bit obsessive about it. Yeah, I think that's that's the only way to be though. It's it it has to be obsessive, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Hundred percent. Yeah, but uh, we we're putting a lot of work into our kids program, so. We haven't really mentioned that. We, we were speaking about the future and, and all these diamonds, but we've got this like kids program that we're really putting a lot of effort into. So I've, I've been working a lot with JP, and, and his kids program is phenomenal. You know, he's producing the best kids jiu-jitsu that I've seen in this country. And we we kind of modeled a lot. We, we use what like what we do with our adults. We followed a lot of his kids program stuff. And and gosh, I look at the kids now, and we've got these like eight year olds that have been doing jiu-jitsu for two years. So, you know, what what these guys are going to be like when they get to, like, 15, 16, when they get to 20, you know, this is, then we're going to be on the world scene, I think. Uh, once we build these 10-year-old youngsters up, uh, it's going to take a couple of years, but these guys are going to be phenomenal. And I think the whole country is in the same position there with their kids. No, absolutely. And, and like, if you if anybody ever goes to the comps, like the jiu-jitsu comps around the local comps, and you see the, the kind of knowledge that these kids possess, for especially for jiu-jitsu and and, and they they come out there and then they're throwing up submissions and they and they really go for it. It's it's actually awesome, awesome to watch. Yeah. And it's, especially if you do a bit of jujitsu yourself and you kind of you're like, geez, I wouldn't even have thought of that myself, you know. And I think kids are quite quite <laughs> fearless, you know. So they so they're not scared to try dangerous things. And, and uh, it's fantastic it's to see. Crazy, and I've been privileged to watch uh, yeah. JP teach his kids as well. And he's he's a, he's a great leader, man. And he's he's doing amazing things there. Some of those some of those kids are really crazy that he's got there. We, we've got some good kids too. They've been doing it a couple of years before we were doing it and JP just put so much energy and like passion into those kids and you can see it. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I, you guys, I take my hat off to all of you guys it's giving your time to teach the kids, man. It's, it's People don't realize it's quite a hard thing to do and it's, and it's a great investment into the future of the sport. And uh, J, JP's fighting this year again, so that's some news. Yeah, I believe he's uh, coming so back. We, we're quite pumped about that one. Yeah, he just he's recovering from his knee up now. So as soon as that thing's fully recovered, then he's he's back in there, and he's he's super pumped. Um, I know he's looking to looking to make a run of it. So I, I haven't seen him like this before. He's like itching to fight. Awesome man, awesome! Can't wait to see you guys back in there. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we can't wait to get this year started already. March is so far away. Yeah, it seems like a lifetime at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Chris, I break from December to March. That's yeah, it, you take about a year. it's just too long, man. Anyways, Chris, we wrap it up there, man. I just want to say again, thank you very much for your time and, and, and for sharing all your knowledge with us. And, and we look forward to seeing you back in there, man. I think it's going to be super, super exciting. Oh. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me. It's really cool what you do. Awesome. Appreciate that, man. And, and enjoy the rest of your evening, evening man. Thanks. Thank you, see you later. Thanks so much, Chris. Have a good one. And we are out. Thank you, Bye-bye.